Sometimes you lose a battle because you got outflanked. Sometimes you lose a war because you got ground into the dust by attrition. And sometimes you lose an entire continent because your generals are bad at coordination and you suck at camping. Welcome to No One Is Competent, the premier history and comedy show about why generals are bad at generaling. Generalship? General works? Who gives a shit? They do, so I don't. Everyone who's ever been in charge has generally been bad at their jobs. That is our motto here. At least worse at their jobs than you are at yours. I'm sure you're quite good at your job. And I'm glad you're here with us today. My name is Azalea. I've got my buddy Jay bringing us a tasty script today. If you want to find us, you can do so on Twitter at Azalea Wyatt and at Jaharis48. Remember, there's a lot of A's in that name. If you want to email us, you can do so at no one is competent at gmail.com. I check that most days. And remember, we are currently doing a promotion. If this podcast gets to a thousand subscribers on our YouTube channel and 50 ratings on Apple Podcasts, I will do a episode where I strain my liver to the maximum. I, we will get at least six drinks in, if not more. Like, I will become completely insufferable. Jay will be in immense pain and suffering, and it will be extremely entertaining for all y'all. Our music is done by the legendary Sam Bryce. The only thing I have left to do on this podcast intro, which I am nailing, by the way, because I am a fucking professional, is to say, Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing quite well. Thank you. Yeah. How are things going for you? I'm, I'm fucking awful. This is like <laughs> the standard Azalea setup. I'm, I didn't get my full workout done before the, it was time to record podcasts. Like I do the other half afterwards. I'm eating. I'm watching Melee in another day. Just, just out of curiosity, Jay, how many Google Docs do you think I have open in my computer right now? Docs or tabs? Tabs of Google Docs. Uh, five. Seven. Okay, close enough. I have just just the one, and four tabs in total at the moment. How? I mean, when was the last time you had four tabs open? <laughs> Did you hit rock bottom and do like a major purge recently? No, I usually close a bunch of stuff uh, whenever we're recording. Oh, that's sweet. Just makes it easier if I have to like find stuff, you know, I'm not paging through 50 tabs to find the source or whatever. What is your like standard like first tab? I don't like what's to the far left? Mm, I don't necessarily have a standard one. Usually it's probably just YouTube or Twitter, I would guess. Well, that's deranged. For me, it's my email. I just, like, always have my email. My Gmail is my, my first tip. I mean, <laughs> I don't check my, you know, outside of work, I would rather not check my email constantly. <laughs> you know, once every few days is, is good enough. I mean, I, I don't get a lot of emails. But it's, like, it's just sitting there, you know? It's like, why not? Yeah. If it's really important, uh, they'll they'll find another way. Yes. It's really important, like contacting you on Discord, which you always <laughs> respond to properly, or on Twitter, like you <laughs> always respond to properly. Yeah, I mean, it's not like I have Twitter open that much either. Uh, yeah, anyone who <laughs> sent you an email containing, for example, an MP3 file for you to upload on time would be totally assured that even though they got it in at like 8 p.m. on Thursday, they, they would be ready. I mean, listen, when they're talking about, you know, the grand scheme of time, whether it's 8 p.m. or, you know, 8 a.m. the following day or whatever, it doesn't really matter that much. All this will wither and fade like <laughs> dust in the wind, right? Indeed. Is that where we're going? Yes. 
Drew, have you ever even heard the, the band Kansas? You've quoted them to me before. No, I don't talk about Kansas often. That was a different band that you're getting this confused with. Yeah, whatever. So what's our topic for today? Yeah, so today uh, we are talking about the Battle of Saratoga. Or Battle of Saratoga. finally doing the American Revolution. Yeah, uh, it's... Kind of uh, weird it's taken this long to it's been a while. get to it. I mean, you know, you're American. I'm American. I would guess the majority of our listeners are probably American. That means we all learn like the basics in school. And Yo, at least all for of our me, Venezuelan and Czech listeners send us emails. <laughs> yeah. At least for me, that means that like the American Revolution for most of my life has not been something I've been interested in just because it's like it's the bog standard history I learned at school. And that does it a bit of a disservice because it there actually is a lot of interesting stuff that goes on including what we're talking about today. But like, you know, it's not the first thing that comes to mind when I think of interesting history topics, which is a, a great way to to lead this episode with. <laughs> like, I'm really interested in like Boston street fighting culture of the day. Um, I'd like to do some research into like Mad Anthony Wayne. He seems like some a, a character from the period that I like. Um, but... Yeah, it's like when it's like the first thing you learn about in American high, uh, like fourth grade social studies. Yeah. <laughs> so you're just like, yeah, it's the normal thing, aka the boring yeah. thing. Exactly. Um, so what are our sources? Our sources for today are Saratoga, seventeen seventy seven, Turning Point of a Revolution by Brendan Morrissey, British Disaster at Saratoga by David A. Morris for Military Heritage Magazine, and Sir William Howe, A Study in Failed Strategic Leadership by Colonel Brian Joseph McHugh of the U.S. Army. Now, you know that Jay is a Yankee because he sees the word heritage and, like, alarm bells don't immediately just start screaming <laughs> in his brain. Listen, that's, uh, we're not talking about that war <laughs> just yet. <laughs> All right, so the Battle of Saratoga took place in the American Revolutionary War. Why did the American Revolutionary War happen? Well, we're not going to fucking tell you. Listen, like we just got into it, especially if you're American, the Revolutionary War is like the most covered topic in history. You know what happened. You know what led to the... American Revolution. There were a bunch of drunken Bostonites who wanted to found a country on kicking cops out of town and smuggling drugs. And so they decided to do so. And honestly, it was pretty dope for a while. And like they tried to form a government and they fucking went downhill. Yeah, pretty much. You know, it's something where it's like, it's such a part of the mythos of the country that You've all heard, you know, Boston Tea Party and the Massacre and, you know, Paul Revere and uh, and everything like that. It's, eh, if you really want to know more, there are a lot of, it, it, this is a very well-covered topic. You can find a lot of good information on the American Revolution very easily. Um, so we're just going to go to the war. And what you need to know for the war, if you're not American, understand that there are some non-Americans who do listen to this, and it might kind of suck for them. But what you need to know is that you have the 13 colonies in British North America that are trying to become independent. They're pushing for their in independence for a whole reason of political and economic reasons. And... This war really begins around April of 1775 with the battles of Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts. The early phase of the conflict would see simultaneous uprising by militia forces across the 13 colonies, and British forces throughout North America were basically just dispersed in a bunch of small, lightly manned garrisons at this point, which makes them very easy target for the rebels. I mean, they're literally wearing red coats. Yeah. <laughs> this is a good target. Yeah. The situation's so desperate that, you know, 
the city of Boston itself comes under siege almost immediately. Now, a month after Lexing Lexington and Concord, the Second Continental Congress, which is a legislative body formed by representatives from all the different colonies, convened in Philadelphia. This body set about establishing both a new government and a new military for the fledgling rebellion. The Continental Army was formed out of the various militias around Boston, and a bunch more would later be merged in, and George Washington was selected as the commander-in-chief. One thing I'd like to mention just off the bat is a thing that's heavily forgotten is that when, and you might not know about it if you're not an American listener, is like when the, quote, colonies rebelled. Rebellion was not like the overwhelming political opinion of colonists. There were thousands of people who wanted to remain uh, loyal to Britain and who would fight to do so. And there were thousands more who were just like, ah, whatever, I just want to, like, till my land on my farm. You assholes can do that over yeah. there. <laughs> it was yeah, not there like... Are, there are a lot of neutrals. A, a unanimous uh, outcry of freedom. Yes, very much so. Now, the latter half of 1775 and beginning of 1776 would prove to be a fruitful time for the revolutionaries. Much of the countryside is seized by rebel forces, with New England, New Jersey, Virginia, and North Carolina proving to be hotbeds of revolutionary fervor. The Continental Army invades Quebec, campaigning up Lake Champlain and the St. Lawrence Valleys and seizing Montreal in November 1775. And by March of 76, the British are forced to evacuate Boston and regroup in Halifax. Basically, almost everywhere it seemed that the British were on the back foot. Now, on the 4th of July, 1776, the formal Declaration of Independence is ratified by the Continental Congress. That means that up until this point, a reconciliation with the Crown was still technically possible, though very unlikely. There was a, um... The olive branch letter, right? Yeah. Like, there, yes. it was somewhat popular for the first year that, like, this would all kind of get kiboshed. Yeah, I heard that, you know, we'll reach some sort of deal, we'll get autonomy, you know, whatever. Absolute independence was not necessarily, like, what everyone was pushing for. Because a lot of people didn't even think it was possible. Yeah. From this point onwards, though, the intent of the colonies was clear complete and total independence from Great Britain. Overnight, these colonies became the 13 United States of America. Now, as a note, for the sake of convenience, I'll be referring to the colonists, the revolutionaries, patriots, whatever, just as Americans for most of this episode, just because it's easy. I know that there'll be some people be like, oh, well, that's kind of misleading, or you should use a different term or this or that. I'm just going to call them Americans. If you complain, you're a bad person. <laughs> and the British, however, were not so keen on seeing these colonies slip from their grasp so easily. They had been caught off guard, to be sure, but in their eyes, the rebels were just a largely disorganized rabble that simply managed to take advantage of British complacency to win their early victories, which, to be fair, is somewhat accurate. Yeah. <laughs> a proper military response would put down the rabble and restore order to North America. No, like, you, y'all need to understand that, like, the vast majority of, quote, officers in, like, the early days of the American military are, like, anyone with any degree of experience from the French and Indian War who was able to stand. You've, you've got 50-year-olds yeah. with, like, tuberculosis, like, going <laughs> into battle. It's not a good time. Indeed. Everyone's drunk. No one knows what a formation is. Uh, they, they got a lot of heart, is what you would say. In like the dis, if, if like the colonists were like a plucky foot, uh, like basketball team in a, in a Disney movie. Indeed. So even before the ink dried on the Declaration, British reinforcements had begun to arrive in numbers. American forces in Quebec had already been weakened by disease, a lack of supplies, and a failed attempt at capturing Quebec City in the winter. 
The British counterattacked in the summer, and by June the Americans were forced out of Canada. The British army in Halifax continued to swell with the arrival of British and Hessian troops from Europe. Hessians are from, you know, some place in the not Germany. <laughs> H- Hesse Castle, almost. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, it's very important because the thing about Hessian troops is you can't beat them with a standard counter. Um, the only or, or attack because they, they can parry all that. You know, from Assassin's Creed Three, the only way to defeat a Hessian is to disarm them and then kill <laughs> them with their own weapon. This is very important. I did not know that actually. And well, goes to Learned see the weakness day. in your sources. <laughs> <laughs> that game is so bad. <laughs> All right, so the commander of British forces in the theater, Sir William Howe, settled on an invasion of New York as a suitable means of bringing the fight to the rebels. British forces landed on Staten Island on July 3rd and proceeded to defeat Washington's Continental Army in a series of battles, therefore setting a pre- precedence that nothing good would happen in Staten Island. By September, New York City had fallen to the British, and the Continental Army was in full retreat. The fall of 1776 would prove to be one of the lowest points of the American cause. Morale was in steep decline following a series of defeats suffered by Washington's forces. The Continental Army dwindled in size as desertion became rampant. The Continental Congress was forced to abandon Philadelphia and move to Baltimore due to the risk of being captured by the British. The chance of... The revolution coming to an effective end seemed very real, but the movement would be spared in large part due to the actions and inactions of the opposing military leaders. Now, throughout the New York campaign, the British had routinely found themselves in the position to capture or destroy the Continental Army, but General Howe repeatedly stymied the attempts of his subordinates to do so. Instead of pursuing the enemy vigorously, Howe carried out a very slow campaign. Now, this is kind of still a matter of historical debate. Um, Howe is often portrayed as a a drunkard idiot, basically, one of the worst generals of the war, who loses the war. Is that inaccurate? He, I mean, he is... He does enjoy his parties. He is very much a womanizer. He spends a lot of time in Boston just, you know, at parties. I mean, it's Boston. (laughs) Yeah. I I think it's worth kind of examining how a little bit in that it's very easy to say that he should have just attacked harder and defeated Washington, captured the Continental Army, or destroyed it. And a lot of his subordinates wanted him to do that. Uh, General Cornwallis and General Clinton, who are his his chief two subordinates, are continuously pushing for him to be more aggressive. But the thing with Howe is that Howe was at the Battle of Bunker Hill uh, at the start of the Revolution. If you know anything about Bunker Hill, it's a bloodbath. It, It was a very Pyrrhic victory. Yeah. The British have around 3,000 troops they suffer about 1,000 casualties. That's one in every three. Which is extremely high for the time. Yeah, I mean, that's like worse than Battle of the Somme, like World War I numbers. (laughs) You know, around 6% of the army is dead, and 6% might not seem a lot if you don't know much about warfare. That's a huge amount. Um, Again, like, that's worse than most World War I battles. And how is, like, a personal witness to all this? And a lot of people will trace his reluctancy to pursuing Washington to Bunker Hill and the idea that if he pursues the Americans, they're going to draw him into a fortified position and inflict heavy losses on his men. And he doesn't have that many men because the British army is not huge. They've kind of put together quite a lot. He has around 30,000 men. That's very big by British standards. But he knows that, you know, if he loses like a thousand men, he's not getting those men back. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, he's not getting reinforcements. So I, I think that's kind of the deal with how. I do think he's not a good general. I think he's overly cautious. He reminds me of McClellan a little bit from the U.S. Civil War. Um, I think sometimes you have to be bold and, and daring and you know risk the, the lives of your men, especially in this time period, to be an effective general. And he maybe doesn't have that ability. Um, 
but I don't think it's because of pure stupidity. Anyway, so that's my uh, spiel on how. Uh, so anyways, uh, General Washington, for his part, made a bunch of errors throughout the summer and fall of 1776. He had often handled his army very poorly and had been outmaneuvered by the British. I mean, this is a man who literally was handed command and said, I do not think I am, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can, like, meet the moment. Yeah, like, as a pure tactical commander, Howe is better than Washington. I think most people would agree with that. You know, Howe will never lose a battle, arguably, in the American Revolution. He, he's a very good battlefield commander, and Washington isn't. But Washington is a quick learner and he develops a skill for extricating his forces largely intact from these battles. The master of retreat. Yep. This, combined with Howe's caution, prevented the total destruction of the Continental Army. Washington was eventually able to retreat to Delaware, concentrate his strength, and launch probing attacks at the British at Trenton and Princeton. These battles were relatively small and of little immediate importance, but they served to boost American morale before the major campaigns of the coming year. If you've seen the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, that's the Battle of Trenton. Yes, the guy on the dollar bill's greatest strategic move was getting his boys up in the middle of the night and slitting German throats on Christmas morning. <laughs> yeah. It's very heroic. Indeed. Still, even though the morale had been buoyed, uh, the Continental Army was still in need of significant aid if it was to survive. The army was running severely low on gunpowder and other key supplies. Both the Spanish and the French were willing to trade with the colonies, but Congress had basically no money to pay them with. A direct foreign intervention was increasingly seen as necessary, but the powers of Europe remained reluctant to get embroiled in such a risky war. You know, you don't want to back a, a losing cause. So the early months of 1777 saw relatively few battles. The defeats of 76 had convinced Washington that head-on confrontation with the British Army was to be avoided unless the conditions were highly favorable. For the time being, the Americans would instead focus on raids and skirmishes designed to disrupt British supply lines, deny them forage, and isolate Loyalist forces. The British, meanwhile, were preparing for a new offensive. The shape this offensive would come to take would be largely determined by an individual who at this point played a more subordinate role in the war, Lieutenant General John Burgoyne. John Burgoyne was born in 1722 to a relatively minor aristocratic family. He went on to have a fairly standard upper-class education and purchased his first commission into the cavalry at the age of 15. Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean, purchased his <laughs> commission? How the fuck does that work? So here we get into one of the, uh, the fun things about the British Army at this time period, it, which is that it was the norm for officers to buy their commissions. You know, if you're a civilian and you want to be an officer, you pay a bunch of money and you become a captain or a colonel or a major or whatever. And it needs to be clear that, like, historically speaking, buying your job into a government bureaucracy was relatively common going back to Roman times. Yeah. It seems ludicrous to us today. Um, but it was the norm and there were like arguments people would make for it. The idea being that like, oh, if you have wealth, that shows that like you're an upstanding individual or that you're a stakeholder, you know, you have a vested interest in, in the state or whatever. Um, and for the most part, it was just a way of keeping the, the officer class as basically a, a very weird aristocratic social club, but that's how it worked. And when we say purchasing work commission, we're not talking about like the the uh, modern day equivalent of eighty bucks, right? Like this is a, no, a significant it's expensive. purchase. Like being like the lowest ranks you could get would cost the equivalent of thousands of dollars. Um, and then you're you're very quickly going up to, to like tens of thousands and eventually even hundreds of thousands. 
But this also so means expensive. that you can pay to, like, skip going up the ladder. Yes. That sounds great. <laughs> and that's actually something that Burgoyne kind of can't do. Because while he's from a noble family, his family is not that rich. And he'll have a lot of financial difficulties, which means that he kind of bounces in and out of the army. And he keeps on like buying a commission and then selling the commission because that's also a thing you can do. You buy them from people who are selling theirs. So he doesn't rank it, it, up it's that like quickly. It's like a fucking... It's like a military posi- rank security? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> Um, I got a lot of my monies wrapped up in being a colonel right now. Yeah. He'll get married to a lady named Charlotte Stanley, who's the daughter of a guy named Ward Darby. Darby's not important to this episode. You just need to know that Darby is very, uh, like, very powerful and like old, like prestigious nobility. And because of that, Darby doesn't like Burgoyne. He thinks Burgoyne's way below, you know, his daughter. And basically, like, does not support his daughter, Burgoyne. And that means that Burgoyne, like, has more financial difficulties. Eventually, Burgoyne will be able to win over Darby. And that's when things really turn around for Burgoyne and he has some sort of financial stability. Now, that happens around the time of the outbreak of the Seven Years' War, which is in 1756. And this gives Burgoyne the chance to prove himself as a military leader. Now, Burgoyne will do very well during this conflict. He participates in raids on the French coast, and eventually he carries out you know, a series of battles in Portugal in which he defeats the French um, on a few occasions. Burgoyne makes a name for himself as a bold and effective cavalry commander. He was also known for treating his soldiers very well, which makes him a popular figure with the army. Um, this will some, be something that like he even writes down and tries to introduce as like military reforms, basically being like, "Hey, maybe we don't treat the soldiers like dirt." <laughs> um, yeah. So, following the Seven Years' War, Burgoyne enters politics, and he becomes he gets elected to the House of Commons in 1768. Another kind of weird thing about the British system: a lot of these generals are are in Parliament. Like, a lot of the guys who will fight in America are in Parliament. It, it, it's very weird to us now, but it's just how it was. I don't know. Bring it back. Yeah. Why not? I want to see Mitch McConnell <laughs> try to command a tank battalion. Yeah. Now, not long after the start of the revolution, Burgoyne was sent with British and German reinforcements to support the army of Guy Carleton, who was the governor of Quebec. Now, this meant that Burgoyne took part in some of the campaigns in 1776 that saw the British push the Americans out of Canada. Now, Carleton didn't stop at the border and proceeded to invade the 13 colonies via Lake Champlain. Uh, also, a brief note, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll have a map up of this for this episode. If not, you might want to look at a map of the New York, Quebec area. We're going to be talking a lot about geography, referencing a lot of geography in this episode. And this is a region of the world which I think a lot of people don't know much about. But um, Lake Champlain is this very kind of weird vertical lake. It's almost like an enlarged river that runs north-south. Um, mm-hmm. Just from like a little bit south of Montreal down into upper New York. So Carleton and the British try invading via Lake Champlain... But the Americans had predicted this, and General Benedict Arnold oversees the construction of a makeshift American fleet on the lake, you know, a fleet of gunboats. And the British are eventually able to clear the lake of the American boats. This delays the advance till the winter, and that means that Carleton has to withdraw because campaigning in upstate New York in the winter is not something you do. (laughs) No, it is not. So Burgoyne returned to England in late 1776 following the death of his wife. He used his opportunity to meet with Lord George Germain, Secretary of State for the American Colonies. As the colonial secretary, Lord Germain had final authority over military operations in North America. 
In their meeting, Burgoyne blamed Carleton for lacking the vigor to pursue the Americans and put forth his own plan of attack for the following year. The vigor to not march your troops into the freezing (laughs) forests of upstate New York. Yeah. The British in early 1777 had two main armies in North America. One in Quebec under Carleton and one in New York under General Howe. Howe held New York City and its surrounding areas, but upstate New York remained in American hands. Remember, there ain't no fucking highway system at this point in history. Like, if you're in New York City, getting thousands of people to up what is now, you know, Buffalo and Greece and upstate New York is going to be a massive and dangerous undertaking even in the best of conditions yeah and you'd be weakening New York City while you're doing it so we're going to propose that he be given command of the army in Quebec and use it to advance south into New York along Lake Champlain and eventually the Hudson River Howe would in turn move north along the Hudson with his men the two forces would meet in Albany a third smaller force under General St. Leger I have no idea how the Brits would pronounce that name, so I'm just going to guess and say St. Leger, would be sent down to St. Lawrence River to Lake Ontario and then advance on Albany from the west as a diversion. Now, Burgoyne's goal was not merely to capture New York. By joining his forces with Howe, the British would effectively cut New England off from the rest of the 13 colonies. British leaders viewed New England as the primary source of rebellion and thought that if the region could be isolated, then the rest of the colonies would be easy to pacify. The corridor between Montreal and New York City seemed like the perfect opportunity to do so. Unbeknownst to Burgoyne, however, General Howe spent the winter of 76 and early 77 coming up with his own plans. Instead of prioritizing upstate New York, Howe wanted to advance on Philadelphia and capture the city, and possibly force the Continental Army into a decisive battle. Now, even though these two generals are both based in North America, the job of coordinating their actions would fall upon Lord Germain, who's back in London. This meant that the person with overall authority Wait. over the coming year's campaign... <laughs> yeah. What? Is, yup. <laughs> The guy who's right, and remind over- our, our listeners how long a round trip that is at this point in history on the best of circumstances. That's like two months on the best of circumstances. It can easily go up to like four months. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I would yeah. say two to four months. Yeah. Standard. And it, it's pretty amusing that you have, you know, a guy in Montreal and a guy in New York City, which are... Not, I mean, they're not right next to each other, but they're pretty close in the grand scheme of things. And they're running everything by London rather than talking to each other. Yeah. So in November of 76, Howe has sent a letter to Germain stating that he intended on attacking Philadelphia and Albany in the following year. Shortly afterwards, however, Howe determines that he doesn't have enough men to carry out both operations so he sends another letter to Germain saying that he's only going to be attacking Philadelphia. Germain sends a letter to Howe, authorizing the Philadelphia plan, and doesn't make any mention of Albany. He doesn't tell Howe that he has to go, you know, uh, on the Hudson River up to Albany. Now, now does Germain know about uh, about Burgoyne's plan? <laughs> yeah, so Germain very, you know, definitely should have known. Because Burgoyne is in London at this point, in February 70, of 1777, and is talking to Germain. Burgoyne presumably should have been able to even see Howe's letters himself, but it seems that wasn't the case. Now, Germain authorizes Burgoyne's plan, a plan that is predicated on Howe's support, support that Howe had not received orders to provide. Now, Germain seemingly notices this error, so he does send another letter to Howe telling him, oh wait, no, you also have to attack Albany. But by the time this letter reaches Howe, Howe's army was already aboard ships on their way to attack Philadelphia. 
Now, to add to Great. the confusion, <laughs> to add to the confusion, before departing for Philadelphia, Howard received a copy of orders that were seemingly meant for Carleton up in Quebec, stating that the army in Quebec was to advance south. Howe's subordinates thus pressed him to support this attack, but Howe stuck with his Philadelphia plan. He does leave behind, though, a small force under General Henry Clinton, with instructions to support Burgoyne if the need arose. The end result of all these communications and miscommunications was that the two British armies in North America effectively had no coherent plan for any sort of combined operation going into the summer of 1777. Howe thinks he's, you know, just attacking Philadelphia, that's what I've been ordered to do, and Burgoyne thinks that Howe is going to help him in New York. Now, maybe we might get to this in a second, but, like, but these two armies independently, like, are stronger than, like, the American forces, right? Howe's army is, yeah, is stronger than the Continental Army at this moment, Burgoyne's is a little bit smaller, um, but it's still... Burgoyne's force is definitely a match for the forces that the Americans have in the North at the moment. So the idea that these two armies could independently be successful is not illogical. It's just not the safest play. It's not crazy. I think a lot of it stems from the fact that War Germain has no experience at all campaigning in North America. He does have a military background, but it's solely in Europe. Um, so he doesn't realize how hard it is to move forces around. Yeah, I think he might just see down. like the distance on the map and think that it's relatively easy. And he doesn't know the terrain or the logistical problems. I think Jermaine also kind of is just a bit of an idiot. <laughs> um, he he arrogant. served... Yeah, he served in the Seven Years' War. He actually gets court-martialed for failing to carry out orders and basically kicked out of service. But he ends up getting back in because they, because George III really likes him. That's basically just it. <laughs> um, like, Howe and Burgoyne, like, I don't think are totally without any ability. Germain kind of sucks. <laughs> All right, so the lack of any coherent planning on the part of the British did at least mean that the Americans had a little idea of what their enemy was planning. General Washington predicted that Howe would attempt to either advance north along the Hudson or attack Philadelphia. An additional possibility was that Burgoyne would send the bulk of his army to New York by sea to join with Howe's forces. Washington did not think a southern advance from Canada was likely, given the difficult terrain of upstate New York and the strength of American fortifications, most notably Fort Ticonderoga, which he had an inflated degree of faith in, which is a very artful way for Jay to put it. Washington's key subordinate in the northern theaters were Generals Philip Schuyler and Horatio Gates. Schuyler, the overall commander of the Northern Forces at the start of the year, and yes, I only know how to say that name because of the musical that people were constantly screaming about in my senior year of high school, <laughs> thought that the British were likely to attack from the north and knew that F Fort Ticonderoga was undermanned and in state of relative disrepair. Washington, however, refused Schuyler's initial request for reinforcements, not wanting to risk a chance of them getting cut off and isolated in the fort if Howe was to attack from the south. Still, by June of 1777, the Americans had around 8,500 soldiers in New York, a mix of continental forces and local militia. Now, Burgoyne would launch what would come to be known as the Saratoga Campaign, by advancing south from Quebec with his army on June 14th, 1777. Now, Burgoyne's army was roughly 9,500 individuals strong. This included 4,000 regular British soldiers, 3,600 Hessians, 500 artillerymen, 600 Loyalist and Canadian militia, and 500 Indian allies who were mostly from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, as well as 300 support personnel. The Haudenosaunee are 
the Iroquois. That's how they're commonly called in like most historical textbooks. I'm reluctant to use Iroquois because apparently that's actually not how they like to call themselves. That is inaccurate. So I will say Haudenosaunee, even if I can't pronounce it correctly. <laughs> But that means that they are a confederacy. It's actually a bunch of different tribes that have a governing institution. They're pretty fascinating um, people. Yeah, it's a, actually a very complex, like, government structure, if you could even call it a civil, uh, an organizational structure yeah. around them. Lots of famous, uh, their, their tradition of, of leaders of a lot of famous... Um, uh, chiefs who are like like known for their oratory skill and their ability to to get people together and to work together and to settle differences uh, yeah. bloodlessly sometimes with a little bit of guile it's kind of celebrated in their tradition now as the amount of artillerymen indicates Begoyne brought with him a large amount of artillery 138 guns in total Burgoyne thought that the Americans would be reluctant to engage in open battle and would instead focus on defending fortified positions. Not dumb. Yeah. So the cannons are basically there to prevent a repeat of Bunker Hill. It's also worth noting that Burgoyne has effectively no cavalry. There simply weren't enough suitable horses to be found in Canada. This despite the fact that he was trained as yeah. a cavalry <laughs> officer. Yes. This is a cavalry Bad officer side. leading an infantry army. <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst thing that can happen, Jay? Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. So the first part of Burgoyne's journey goes pretty smoothly. And this is because rather than having to march over land, his army is able to just go down Lake Champlain by boat. And they land a few miles north of Fort Ticonderoga on the 1st of July. And now, meanwhile, General Saint Leger has begun his advance, intended Does as. Does he know what the other two are doing? Yes, I mean Saint Leger gets his orders, um, and so he he knows at least what Burgoyne is doing. Um, so Saint Leger sails down the Saint Lawrence River, and that goes into Lake Ontario, and then he lands in Fort Oswego and begins to march inland towards the Mohawk River. Now, this means that he's marching kind of from the Great Lakes eastwards towards Albany. St. Legere's force consists of roughly 700 British, Hessian, and Loyalist militia soldiers, and they're joined by another 800 Haudenosaunee warriors. Now, the first major confrontation of the Saratoga campaign would take place at Fort Ticonderoga. Ticonderoga was a well-known fortress, having been built by the French in the 1750s, and then strengthened by the British following the French and Indian War. It lay on the southwest bank of Lake Champlain, and guarded a bridge that crossed a narrow point of the lake at the eastern bank. Remember, Champlain is a basically wide river. As of July 1777, it was being held by around 2,200 men under the command of American General Arthur St. Clair. The British siege of Fort Ticonderoga began on the 2nd of July. Ever then commit to a frontal assault, as St. Clair had expected, the British looped around the east of the fort. To the southwest of Ticonderoga lay a rugged hill known as Mount Defiance. Defiance had never been fortified, a weakness that had been identified but not rectified by the fort's British and subsequently American owners. As St. Clair had withdrawn his men to the perceived safety of the fort, the British were able to haul their artillery up to the top of Mount Defiance, a position from which they could fire down on Ticonderoga. Upon learning of this development, St. Clair realized he had no option but to abandon the fort, withdrawing his army under the cover of darkness on the 5th of July. So, Fever in the cap of Burgoyne at this point. The fall of Ticonderoga meant that Burgoyne had captured without a shot the most well-known fortification in the entire region. News of Ticonderoga's fall was meant with outcry across the colonies, leading to St. Clair and Schuyler being accused of being cowards or traitors. The Americans even failed to destroy the pontoon bridge crossing the lake. St. Clair left behind a few men with some cannons and ordered 
to fire on the bridge once the American withdrawal was complete, but these men instead got drunk on a cask of wine, left on the fort, and were easily captured by Burgoyne's Indian scouts. I mean, you trust in New Yorkers to do something. What do you expect? The funny thing is that that exact attitude is like not inaccurate. Um, a lot of New Englanders in this time period basically just blame this all on the dumb New Yorkers. And they're like, the, the New Yorkers are a bunch of like cowards or traitors. You can't trust them. <laughs> There's like a, a, a regional rivalry between... Again, um, yeah. <laughs> where is the lie? <laughs> the one upset of the fiasco was the American army did manage to withdraw largely intact. Remember, we are the retreating goats at this point. Burgoyne pursued the Americans, but the British were met with stiff resistance at the battles of Hubberton and Fort Anne. These actions prevented the American retreat from turning into a disastrous rout. By the 14th of July, St. Clair was able to link with General Schuyler's forces that were concentrating just to the north of Albany. Anything interesting about those battles at all? I'm sure they were more like skir skirmishes or yeah, they're, said stiff resistance. They're pretty small skirmishes. I mean, the British technically win, but they suffer enough casualties um, that way they, they slow their pursuit and the Americans kind of get away. I mean, this is like the classic thing about in, about battles against insurgencies, right? Like, when you look at the American Revolutionary War, when you look at the Vietnam invasion by America, like, winning, losing, who... Casualty counts are an inaccurate way to measure the entire conflict, right? Because it, it forgets that... Battles are about moving towards each enemy's win or lose condition. And, like, even if you technically killed more of their guys, if you lose enough of your guys, you're not going to be able to effectively prosecute your um, your campaign. That's not a, really a win. Yeah, very much so. And good insurgent armies will be good at taking these losses and continuing to fight on. And the Americans are very quickly becoming good at that. Now, that being said, to the British, it must have seemed in early July that more or less everything was going exactly to plan. They had captured Ticonderoga and sent the Americans fleeing while suffering minimal casualties. In hindsight, this would prove to be the high watermark of the entire Saratoga campaign for Burgoyne. The news of Burgoyne's victory at Ticonderoga reached General Howe in New York fairly quickly. And this, however, convinces him that his assistance is unnecessary. Clearly, Burgoyne can handle, you know, the whole thing in upstate New York just fine on his own. We love a general who knows how to delegate. <laughs> Accordingly, the bulk of Howe's army departed by sea for an attack on Philadelphia later that month. Burgoyne, meanwhile, continues to move southwards, but now the difficulties of campaigning in the region began to show. The British were forced to leave behind around a thousand troops to garrison Ticonderoga and guard their increasingly long supply lines. As Lake Champlain comes to an end just south of the fort, the British could no longer rely on easy maritime transportation. Upstate New York is dominated by forests, swamps, hills, and isolated farmsteads. You know, especially when you're talking about the 18th century. Roads existed, but were just barely sufficient to support an advancing army. We're talking about, like, little dirt tracks. Now, a lack of horses deprived Burgoyne not only of cavalry, but of enough draft animals to pull his artillery and supply wagons. He has some hey, horses, hey, hey, but hey. not enough. What are, what, what are infantry, if not glorified <laughs> draft animals, eh? Yeah. Um... Actually, in the uh, in in the siege of Ticonderoga, one of Burgoyne's subordinates, um, General Philip, uh, when he's telling his men to drag the cannons up Mount Defiance, basically says that wherever a goat can go, a man can go, and wherever a man can go, he can drag a cannon. <laughs> Honestly, kind of love it. I mean, hey, like, it it's worked. a dick move, but I kind of love it. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. So, yeah, the British don't have that many horses, 
And to make things worse, a lot of their wagons were built basically very quickly before the campaign, and this means they're constructed out of unseasoned wood, and they're generally two-wheel rather than four-wheel designs. And basically just oh, no. yeah, basically this just means that they fall apart very quickly during this very arduous march. And, and these roads, like like people, the, the, we're talking like dirt and like tons of rocks. And we're yeah. talking like going up and down tons of hills. It's a very hilly terrain in upstate New York. So like these things are going to like their axles are gonna break, wheels are gonna fall off, all their shit's gonna spill out on the road. You gotta grab it, you gotta fix the thing. It's not going to be a fun time. Yeah. Now, with all these difficulties in mind, Burgoyne decides to split off his artillery and heavy supplies and send them to the nearby Lake George, where they could be floated south on barges. Lake George is another one of these north-south lakes. It's a little bit south of Lake Champlain, so he's like, you guys go there, and you can at least go some of the distance by water. The rest of the army, however, would continue on foot. By this point, the American commander in the region, General Schuyler, had figured out roughly what Burgoyne was planning on doing. He knew which road Burgoyne would have to advance along, and thus instructed his soldiers to create as many obstacles for the British as possible. You know, just wanting to draw out those devastating, difficult marches even more. American soldiers and militia destroyed bridges, blocked the road with fallen trees, flooded it in areas. They also carried out a policy of scorched earth, remo removing or destroying all crops and livestock in the area. I'm sure this was even if those crops and livestock belonged to neutral uh, families. Yes. Deprived of forage, the British would have to rely on their increasingly weak supply lines. On August 3rd, the British Army reached Fort Edward at the northern portion of the Hudson River, where they met up with their artillery and suppliers. It was here that Burgoyne received news that Howe was not supporting his campaign, and had instead sailed to Philadelphia. In spite of his news, Burgoyne remained committed to his strategy. We love confidence on this show, don't we? Yeah. Burgoyne decided to rest his army in Fort Edward and send out a raiding party to capture supplies from a colonial depot in Bennington, Vermont. I mean, it was to him, Bennington had been reinforced with over 2,000 militia soldiers. When a party of around 1,000 British and Hessian troops reached Bennington on August 16th, they were surrounded and defeated by the Americans, with the majority of them being taken prisoner. The, that's like a really significant victory for the, yes. <laughs> the year as far as the Americans go. Yeah. They will take that. George Washington goes, we take those boys to the chat. <laughs> the declining situation in Fort Edward led to the withdrawal of most of Burgoyne's Indian allies, always keen of where the wind is blowing. To make matters worse, St. Leger's attack to the east had largely stalled out. St. Leger stopped to lay siege to the American-held Fort Stanwyck and defeated an American relief attempt at the Battle of Oriscotti on August the 6th. To turn the situation around, Schuyler sent another relief force, this time around 700 men under General Arnold. Rumors spread amongst the British camp that Arnold's forces were far larger than it actually was, causing most of St. Leger's Indian allies to abandon the campaign. This in turn forced St. Leger to lift the siege and withdraw back towards Lake Ontario. So, initially, like, Burgoyne wanted, like, him and Howe to, like, team up and just do this all together and lock down New England and go from there. But... Then that didn't work out because having to go through London. But now even the smaller backup force is unavailable to him. Is that, that what I'm seeing? Yes, that's exactly the case. But he still has a numerical advantage at this point. Yes. Now, Schuyler had successfully slowed Burgoyne to halt, whittled down his army, and forced St. Leger to retreat. In spite of all of this, the fall of Ticonderoga was used as political ammunition against Schuyler by his longtime rival, General Horatio Gates. 
Gates had commanded the American effort to invade Canada at the start of the revolution, only to be replaced by Schuyler when that effort failed. Now, Congress ordered Schuyler to be relieved of command and sent Gates as his replacement on August 19th. And, like, that'll work out pretty well for Gates, if I remember my history, right? Like, he's a far more remembered figure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he is far more famous. Now, alongside Gates came reinforcements that brought the strength of the American army in camp north of Albany up to around 10,000 men, meaning that now the Americans outnumber the British, which previously had been the reverse. The Gates, like Schuyler, realized that Burgoyne's intent was to continue south towards Albany. With reinforcements in hand, he determined that the Americans were now in a position to offer a battle to the British. Gates also inherits much of Schuyler's staff, including the skilled Polish military engineer Colonel Tadeusz Kuczysko. Kuczysko had been responsible for directing a bunch of the Scorched Earth campaign against Burgoyne, and now he would play another role by selecting a defensive position for the American army to occupy, an area of high ground known as Bemis Heights, roughly 20 miles to the north of Albany, and 8 miles to the south of the town of Saratoga. This is one of like the cool few cool like things about studying the American Revolutionary War is like all of just the random Europeans who show up and yeah. <laughs> often end up like flourishing. Yeah, very much so. Like good for you, Coach Joysko. Yep. The Bemis Heights is on the west bank of the Hudson, and the road that's being used by the British, or that they think the British are gonna use lies basically between the heights and the river. So you can imagine you have the river, then go a little bit to the left, you have the road, and then a little bit to the left, you have this hill. Now this means that Bemis Heights is a prime position to block the British advance. Now, of course, this position will be useless if Burgoyne marches along the east bank of the Hudson. But given that Albany was on the west side of the river, Kuchoisko predicted that Burgoyne would have to go on the west as well. Gates agreed with this analysis and ordered the construction of defensive earthworks along the Bemis Heights. Burgoyne's army had departed Fort Edward in late August, resuming their difficult march. As per Kuchoisko's prediction, the British crossed over to the west bank of the Hudson on September 13th before continuing southwards. Which I'm sure was a difficult, arduous, yeah. <laughs> wet, and miserable process. Yeah. All right, on to the Battle of Saratoga. A few days after crossing the Hudson, Burgoyne's advance forces began to skirmish with the Americans near Bemis Heights. Burgoyne realized the strength of the American position, but knew that he had to attack it if he were to have any hope of taking Albany. It is what it is. So he left the road and arrayed his force in the woods and hilly terrain north of Bemis Heights. At this point, Burgoyne had around 7,500 soldiers to Gates' 10,000. What would come to be remembered as the Battle of Saratoga was really two battles. The first occurred on September 19th, when the British launched an attack on the American left. Burgoyne hoped to capture a hill to the east of his heights and position artillery there to threaten the American position, just like he had done in Ticonderoga in July. Gates dispatched a division led by Arnold to block the British, leading to a prolonged battle in the vicinity of a local farmstead. The Battle of Freeman's Farm took place over much of the day, with both sides attacking, gaining ground, and then being driven back by enemy counterattacks. By nightfall, the British had gained the advantage, and American forces withdrew from the farm. The British had suffered around 600 casualties to the Americans' 350. Now the next day saw a pause in the fighting, as Burgoyne decided to rest his forces rather than pressing the attack. This suited Gates well, who was confident in his defensive position. That day, a messenger reached Burgoyne with news that General Henry Clinton, the man left in charge of New York by Howe, was preparing to make an attack on Fort Montgomery, a hundred miles south of Saratoga with 2,000 men from the New York garrisons. Elated with the prospect of finally receiving support from the British Army in New York, Burgoyne decided to wait and hope that Gates would be forced to split off a portion of the American Army to deal with Clinton. 
In the meantime, the British would construct a series of redoubts, temporary field fortifications, to show up their line. So, like, he's basically just, like, going to sit there and hope that the problem is taken away from him. Yes. <laughs> basically. Meanwhile, his opponent can continue to reinforce their already superior defensive position. Yes. And uh, and cool. Gates says, and, and the American army is, like, growing each day because of militia arriving in the area. So yeah, not 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 great. <laughs> and yeah, we we have really th- th- this would be I think my first like just full boneheaded move. Yeah, this period of hope would prove to be short lived. As the days dragged on, it became clear that Quentin's force was too far away to have any impact. Desertion increased as the British camp began to run out of food their supply lines having been cut by militia forces. The, uh, the Americans kind of, like, swing around a little bit and attack on, like, George, and that means that, like, the British can't get any more supplies. The weather also turns against the British, with continuous rain turning the fields to mud. Um, there's a story about, like, the British, after they buried their dead from um, the Battle of Freeman's farm. The rain sweeps in and basically uncovers all the shallow graves and they're forced to then like sit and stare at rotting corpses. So not very pleasant. Delightful. Yeah. So basically Gates' force is growing because militia keep on joining him and the British force is sinking because people keep on deserting. This means that Gates quite reasonably decides that all he has to do is wait. Now, with his supplies running low, Burgoyne is essentially left with two options, try to retreat back north or attack the Americans. He decides on the latter. On October 7th, the British launch a probing attack on the American left with 1,500 men. The Americans launch a strong counterattack, repulsing the British. Arnold, again, is involved in the fray, leading a force to attack the British redoubts. By the end of the day, the Americans had captured a British redoubt and inflicted 700 casualties upon the enemy, at the cost of 150 casualties of their own. What are, what are these redoubts looking like? We're just talking about, like, some, like, wood palisades and, like... Yeah. Maybe those, like, you know, cross-lashing, big, sharpened sticks of wood to let in, into like the X formations so like people can't get past or like yeah yeah it's, you know these wood palisades maybe some packed earth um above the ground you know it's not a trench um but yeah kind of like a basic uh defensive position all done with hand tools yeah the action of October 7th which would go on to be remembered as the Battle of Venice Heights or the second Battle of Saratoga the first being the fight at Freeman's farm, convinced Burgoyne that withdrawal was the only option left. The British began their withdrawal the following day, marching north through the mud towards Saratoga. Gates pursued Burgoyne, and joined by other American forces in the area, he was able to surround Burgoyne by October 10th. With all of his options exhausted, Burgoyne requested terms for surrender. An agreement was signed on the 16th, granting lenient terms to the British. The British regular forces and Hessians would be disarmed and allowed to return to Europe, with the agreement stipulating that they could not fight in the war any longer. Loyalist and Canadian militia forces would also be disarmed and allowed to return to their homes. Burgoyne's surrender granted the Americans a windfall of prisoners and supplies. In addition to 6,500 enemy soldiers, Gates took possession of around 37 artillery guns, 4,647 muskets, and 72,000 cartridges. The terms Burgoyne and Gates negotiated at Saratoga, however, would not be carried out by Continental Congress, which viewed them as far too lenient. Congress instead declared that London would have to sign on to the surrender agreement. The British refused, because they're doing the whole we don't negotiate with terrorists thing. And this means that the bulk of Burgoyne's army would spend the rest of the war in American prisoner of war camps. Burgoyne himself, as well as as other high officers, however, were released and allowed to return to England. 
Like they almost <laughs> always are. Yeah. yeah. Being a prisoner of war in the American Revolution was not very good. Conditions on the POW camps on both sides were very poor. Mostly just not out of design, but just like general supply conditions of both armies tended to be pretty poor. So not a fun time. The Saratoga would prove to be one of the most important battles in the entire war. Not only had the British failed at isolating New England from the rest of the colonies, but the Americans had comprehensively defeated a large, professional British army. The British had already been considering formally supporting the Americans prior to Saratoga, with debate in Paris continuing between pro- and anti-war factions becoming increasingly tense. Two days after the news of victory at Saratoga reached France, King Louis the 16th agreed to enter into negotiations for a treaty with the Americans. France would formally declare war on Britain in March of 1778, which would go totally great for them. Yeah. <laughs> and not set up what is now, what will be on seven or eight <laughs> episodes in a series. And one of the fun things is that when the French arrive, they bring like tons and tons of gold to you know just so it's like the continental army can pay their men and like this is great for the continental army maybe not so good for the french treasury <laughs> it's fine we'll just like create a currency backed by um seizing the <laughs> land of a of the largest religious denomination the main result of Saratoga was to bring about a stalemate in the Northern Theater of Operations. The Americans had failed to invade Canada, and the British had failed to invade America. This stalemate would continue as the British looked elsewhere to continue their war effort, and the rest of the conflict would mostly take place in the middle and southern parts of the region. Yes. Yeah, so Howe actually does capture Philadelphia, and he occupies it until the middle of 78, and then he realizes, you know, He's not getting anything accomplished. He doesn't really have enough men to hold it. So he withdraws from Philadelphia. And that's when the British, you know, shortly afterwards switch to their southern strategy, which is to try to capture uh, cities in the south and support loyalists in the south because they think there are a lot of loyalists down there. The funny thing is there were a lot of loyalists in the south. The early years of the war... Slave planters tend to like empires. <laughs> The, the early years of the war were, in a way, almost like a civil war in the South between Patriot and the Loyalist militia. But because the British are spending these early years in the forests of New York, they're not supporting the Loyalists. And by the time they actually go to the South, it's somewhat too late. I mean, they do win some victories, uh, but it's not enough. And... This is also when the French really start arriving in large amounts. And by that point, the British cause is, is mostly over. You know, the Battle of Yorktown, where they're forced to surrender, is in many ways more of a French victory than an American victory. It's the French who will do most of the siege work. It's the French Navy who will cut off the British from resupply. And, and, the, and cutting off the bay is the big thing at Yorktown. Yeah. <laughs> and... That's what eventually forces their surrender. The rare French naval dub. Yeah. Indeed. So, a lot of these generals will go on to have kind of differing lives after Saratoga. Burgoyne will go back to London. He remains in Parliament. Um, he also, like, writes plays and stuff like that. He will maintain... Are they any good? I don't know. <laughs> I think they're like considered it okay. Um, he'll maintain that like he did nothing wrong. He got screwed over by the politicians or his subordinates or you know the other generals, whatever. Um, it, he's he was a Tory before um, the war, but he kind of switches to the Whigs because the Tories blame him for losing. And the Whigs kind of, like, buy into, like, oh, like, the government screwed him over thing. Yeah, well, Whigs are known for not understanding how history works, so that, that does track. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, General Howe will resign in, in the following year and go back to, go back to Britain. 
Um, he'll be replaced by Clinton and eventually Cornwallis. And Lord Germain will remain in charge of the British effort for the rest of the war, uh, for all the good that does. On the American side, um, Schuyler doesn't do much after this. Gates will use this victory to kind of intrigue against George Washington and try to promote himself as to become the leader of the Continental Army. This won't work. Horatio Gates is like kind of a... He, he, he's a good friend, bad enemy kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's very um, sharp character. Yeah, he, he's a bit of a schemer. Um, he'll get sent south during the uh, the British Southern Campaign and will lose to um, uh, Cornwallis at the Battle of Camden, and that basically ends Gates' military career. He won't do much afterwards. Um, though he will kind of get the credit for Saratoga because the other person who's associated along with the fighting is a guy named Benedict Arnold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So here's here's my question. Because, <laughs> like, the way I was taught all this shit in a push is that, like, the real genius behind Saratoga was Benedict Arnold. Yeah. Who, like, then tried to, like, ch change sides in one of, you know, the, the most, you know, 355 IQ is actually 35 IQ plays in history. But this guy's, like, barely come up in the entire episode. Yeah. Are you telling me that Mr. Dudley <laughs> lied to me, Jay? I think Arnold, Benedict Arnold went through, like, a weird historiographical swing where, like, you know, he goes from being, like, the standard go-to name for a traitor and a horrible person in America to then people being like, oh, maybe he was actually good or, like, he was smart or he was a really good general. Maybe he was better than George Washington. I think people went too far in that direction in over-appraising his role or his abilities. He's a very good tactical commander. Um... I didn't talk much about like so what, the what individual. Was he like under how? Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. Was was what was his role? Was, was 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 he under Gates? Yes, he's under Gates, and basically, when the Americans are fighting in um, Freeman's Farm and Bennis uh, Bennis Heights, he's like the general who Gates sends out in Freeman's Farm to lead the American forces, actually, like in that skirmish. Well, Gates is sitting in the rear. So you can imagine, like, Gates is kind of the guy sitting back in camp, directing things. Arnold's the guy he's on the, the front line. getting things done. Yeah. And he's very good at that. He is a very good tactical commander. He's a very brave individual. And he's the one who is, like, individually, like, leading men into battle. You know, when people are kind of retreating or running, he's getting them to, to calm down, to reform and regroup and go back on the attack. So he does a lot of that at Freeman's farm. Uh, Gates does not like him. <laughs> he and Gates have a hatred because, like, officer corps in, like, both the British and American armies are these weird, like, social clubs, and everybody either loves or hates each other. Um, so Gates, like, tries to dismiss Arnold after Freeman's farm, but, like, doesn't actually do it. And then Arnold, again, at Bemis Heights, is one of the guys leading the American, like, leading the charge on the ground. So Arnold does definitely play a role. That being said, I think the idea that Arnold's a strategic genius, and he has the credit stolen from him because he's a traitor afterwards, is, is misplaced. Um, Schuyler and Gates both knew what they were doing, both had pretty good strategies, um, Arnold is in large part responsible for carrying these strategies out, but he's not the genius. He's not like the Napoleon figure here. And for those who, again, aren't American, I know we're assuming everybody's kind of American when they're, when they're talking about this, Benedict Arnold will turn traitor because he basically is just angry at Congress. He thinks that his subordinates are getting promoted above him. He's not getting his due, whatever. He will enter into secret negotiations with the British and switch sides. And because of that is uh, a despised figure in American history. Yeah, when I, 
look at this campaign. You know, one of the things that reminded me of was a question you had asked me in one of our previous episodes on the Napoleonic Wars, where you asked me, like, how good are the British? Because I joked earlier that, like, the British army wasn't very good. And I think this, even though this is, you know, a few decades prior, kind of shows what I'm getting at, is that the British are good on, like, the individual, on the small unit level, but their system for conducting large land wars is very lacking. It's just idiotic. Like, yeah. like first they were, like, re- you know, relying on this non-meritocratic system. And, yeah. and then, like, ha- I, I know this, this might be too hard a question, but, like, do they keep like doing this 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 thing where like all orders have to be run like through London for like the rest of the Revolutionary War or for like other wars? Like this is just they this get, is just ridiculous. They get a bit better at it, um, but yeah, it, it's a pretty ridiculous system. It really stems from the fact that they underestimated the strength of the opposition and underestimated the difficulty of the terrain and of campaigning in North America. And, like, their leaders don't have a good appreciation for the strategic side of warfare. You know, General Howe is a very good tactical leader, but completely lacking when it comes to any sort of broad strategic picture. Whereas somebody like George Washington, tactically average, I think, but has a very good strategic mind in comparison. And and this is going to be, like, the... Britain's real deficiency in this period, as well as in the, you know, the early coalition wars, is that their leaders just aren't good about seeing the big picture of warfare. It's worth noting that the Royal Navy, you know, the very effective part of the British military, does not sell commissions. (laughs) Um, Huh. Yeah. Now, in order to be an officer in the Royal Navy, you generally did have to come from an upper class background because you needed money for education. But you couldn't buy a commission in the Royal Navy outright. Yeah, but then that would also be the case for the British Army if they chose yeah. to do it like that too, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and most armies in Europe had moved away from purchasing commissions. The French had gotten rid of that in like the 1750s. The Prussians the had gotten French. rid of that. <laughs> yeah. The Austrians kind of still had it, but we're trying to phase it out. Like, the British are the most committed to this purchasing commission system, and will purchasing commissions will be a thing until the 1870s. Though, a bit of a fun fact is actually Horatio Gates purchased his commission in the British Army um, during the, the, the French and Indian War. And I mean, that's kind of why he was then in position to be an officer in the American army in the, in the, in the revolution. Well, we all love fun facts. Fun fact about this show. Our music is done by the legendary Sam Bryce. If we get to, once again, 1,000 YouTube subscribers and 50 reviews on apple podcasts we will do an episode where i am drunk off my gourd jay is there anything we want to say before we wrap up the battle of saratoga uh no i think that's about it all right i think this this uh episode was easy i think it was it was breezy uh frankly it was wait what's I, f- I forget whose tagline is that there's like some beauty code it's like easy breezy beautiful is it is it cover girl i think it's cover girl who gives a shit jay doesn't know anyway i hope y'all have a beautiful day wherever you are uh just remember um pain is temporary uh gain is forever and um if you play e5 knight f3 uh, in chess, in response to the Karl Khan, um, you're a fucking degenerate who should jump off a bridge. Um, and that's all I got to say about that. All right. Podcast is over. Goodbye. <laughs>